don't know. Okay. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. So nice to see everybody. You know, over the last few months, we uh, brought to you some very interesting guests that had intriguing stories to tell. But I must tell you that tonight's guest is something special and unique. I first learned about his story, or at least little bits of his story, last year at the International Kinnis HaShluchim, which is the conference of Chabad rabbis that's held annually in New York. I don't know exactly how the convention and the gathering of the rabbis is going to work this year with Corona. Let's hope that we're past it by then. And I heard the rabbi talking, and I said to myself, we got to bring him here to speak to our community, but he lives in Delaware. How are we going to bring him here to Orange County? Little did I know at the time that we will be able to share the good rabbi with everybody from the comforts of our home. So without further ado, it is my honor to introduce to you Rabbi Mati Flickstein, who has shared his personal story and has captivated audiences the world over. Also known as the Rapping Rabbi. He serves as a Chabad Rabbi in Wilmington, Delaware, along with his wife and six children. Ladies and gentlemen, please offer a warm welcome to Rabbi Mati. Hey, can everybody hear me? Yeah, all right. So how's everybody doing? All right. Yeah. Okay. I can't hear you, but I can see you. So let's start by teaching a little bit of Hasidic sign language. How about that? Everybody want to learn a little bit of Hasidic sign language? Okay. So it's like this. You ask a Jew, how are you doing? The answer is Baruch Hashem. Thank God. It's all good. So I'll teach you the universal Hasidic sign for Baruch Hashem, for thank God. So it's like this. How's everybody doing? Baruch Hashem. Okay, let's try that. Let's see if we're quick learners over here in Laguna Nagil. Here we go. How's everybody doing? Baruch Hashem. Oh, fantastic. Thank you guys so, so much for having me. It's really, really amazing that just with a click of a button, I can travel all the way to the West Coast and meet you guys and get to meet this long lost family because that's really what we are. We're all one big dysfunctional family. No, <laughs> we're all one big happy family. And um, this is basically a family reunion because sometimes you meet family, sometimes you don't, but we're family nonetheless. So it's really, really an honor to be here with you guys this evening. So I want to share a story with you about a teenage boy named Matt. Matt grew up in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, in a warm home with Jewish parents and his sister. But that's about all that was Jewish in his home. There was even a time that in the winter, instead of a menorah in his window, there was an Xmas tree. Instead of Shabbat dinners on Friday nights, there were constant parties and outings. Matt never saw the inside of a synagogue, and he had no idea what being Jewish even meant. Not religiously, not culturally, nothing. In his early teens, Matt ran with the wrong crowd. He got involved in the rap scene, and he started gravitating towards crime and drugs. In desperation, his parents reached out to the local Chabad to see if they might be able to help them with their wayward son. Matt was truly uninterested. But after the unrelenting pleas of his parents, he finally agreed to give it a shot. He showed up on a Shabbat morning sporting a huge afro and dressed like a thug straight out of a gangster movie. 
he fully expected the rabbi to be shocked by his appearance. But what happened instead shocked Matt to his core. The smiling rabbi rushed over to him, embraced him with a huge bear hug, and with a warm welcome, invited him in. That moment, that hug, changed Matt's life. Because that moment demonstrated to Matt that external appearances mean nothing. That it's the Yiddish neshama, the soul, that truly defines who he is. My friends, ladies and gentlemen, my family from Laguna Niguel, that hug happened many years ago, but I can still feel that hug today because Matt was me. Because in his heart of hearts, a child always wants to come home. And his father wants to bring his children into his arms. You simply open up your ears and hear he's trying to call for you to come home. Please come home. Just come home to Tati. In his heart of hearts, a child always wants to come home. And his father wants to bring his children into his arms. You simply open up your ears and hear he's trying to call for you to come home. Please come home. Just come home to Tati. Set in my ways, I'm getting delayed. When will I change? I don't know. I'm just letting it wait. I'm thinking when I'll get paid and when I'm getting a date. Misbehaved in ways and played games I'm regretting today. Stepped on the brakes. My life has been a mess and a waste. Checking my veins for a pulse because I feel dead in some ways. I started getting afraid. Did I want to be heading this way? Watching my mom dry her eyes till she was red in the face. It's got to be better some way and I still remember the day that I got fed up with my setup started questioning things is life about getting the cake should I be rejecting what's fake why on the deathbed no one thinks about their checks in the bank I needed a better escape and I just felt it one day a voice inside me told me to look up to heaven and pray but I can't repent right away I'm already 20 and change turn to Hashem with full faith because it's never too late I'm coming home yeah cuz in his heart of hearts a child always wants to come home and his father wants to bring his children into his arms you simply open up your ears and hear he's trying to call for you to come home please come home just come home to Tati in his heart of hearts a child always wants to come home and his father wants to bring his children into his arms you simply open up your ears and hear he's trying to call for you to come home please come home just come home to Tati in his heart of hearts a child always wants to come home and his father wants to bring his children into his arms you simply open up your ears and hear he's trying to call for you to come home please come home just come home to tati come home please come home just come home to tati said come home to tati please come home to tati said come home please come home just come home to tati Woo! All right. So how's everybody doing in Laguna Niguel? Baruch Hashem. Thank you to the Snyders. Thank you, Gerilyn. Thank you to everybody. Ah, oh. <laughs> there we go. You guys are experts. I should take you guys on tour with me. It's fantastic. It's easy to go on tour with me. You know, I don't have to pay for your tickets or anything with Zoom. It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> anyway, so thank you again for having me. It's really, really, really uh, a pleasure to be here with you guys. Just a quick question. Did you guys see my screen just now when I was sharing it? You saw it? Okay, fantastic. So, Baruch Hashem. Thank you, Geraldine. Just keep going. Just keep waving your arms. It'll be good. We should always say Baruch Hashem every moment of our lives anyway. It's good. <laughs> so, anyway, thank you guys again. Nice to meet you guys. Now, sometimes people hear this little uh, snippet of the story that you just heard. You know, from when I was this thug, troublemaking, druggy kid to... You fast forward and they see me today as a Chabad rabbi, you know, a community in Delaware I'm responsible for, a wife and six beautiful children, Baruch Hashem. And uh, they think, wow, 
that was some transformation you went through. And that must have been a pretty magical hug that that rabbi gave you. But as you can imagine, that hug that he gave me, it wasn't just that, you know, I woke up the next morning and I looked in the mirror and poof, I had a hat and a beard and a coat. It didn't quite work out that way. It's a long journey. And to be honest with you, the journey still continues until today. And if we're all honest with ourselves, every single one of us is on a journey. None of us ever really arrives. Because from the second that we're born and we're sent down here into this world, our souls are sent into a body, then we go off on a journey. And we're on a journey to spread good and light and positivity and godliness to the world around us. And that journey continues until the journey is all over. And so my journey still continues until today. And to be perfectly honest with you, I didn't actually share my entire story until about two years ago. I always thought, you know, what's the point of sharing my story? It's a personal thing. It's, oh, is it really going to relate to people? It's a little uncomfortable to speak about yourself in front of so many people you don't know yet. By the end of the night, we'll know each other very well, God willing. But, uh, you know, what's the point? Why should I just talk about myself? And then little by little, people started to get bits and pieces of the story out of me. And I saw that as I was sharing it, it was helping people in many different areas in their lives. And I shared it more and more. And I came to the realization, and it's based on a teaching of the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, who taught that every single thing that we see, hear, and experience is for a reason. And it's all because it's supposed to teach us some kind of lesson and it's supposed to give us the tools to be able to make a difference given our experiences. And so if it's true for a single episode, then it must be true for 20 plus years of a life that I experienced until I kind of changed the trajectory of my life. And so maybe, just maybe, why I experienced everything that I experienced a lot of ups, a lot of downs, a lot of challenges, a lot of difficulties, maybe was all just so that I could share it all with you guys this evening in Laguna Niguel, because maybe, just maybe, it'll help one person, and then it'll be worth the entire thing. So I invite everybody to fasten their seat belts. We're ready to journey. As you can see, there isn't too much traffic on the road behind me, so it should be smooth sailing from here on out. Is everybody ready? All right. I know Geraldine's ready. I know that Alan's ready, I see. Okay, excellent. Irwin is ready. We're all ready. Okay, here we go. So the journey starts naturally with my family. I come from a Russian family. My parents, my parents are from Russia, and as with many of the Russian Jews, they weren't given much of a Jewish education, actually not a Jewish education at all, as a result of the circumstances. So they didn't have any Jewish education whatsoever. The entirety of their Jewish education was one thing. They weren't told why or what or anything. They were told that for some reason, it's important that when you grow up, you marry somebody who's Jewish. So they grew up, they found each other, and they got married. They ended up making their way to the States, where they moved to the Philadelphia area. And they had two children. They had my older sister. Her name is Fanny. She's four years older than me. She lives in New City, New York now, and she is a lawyer. By the way, I'm going to be giving a quiz at the end, so I hope everybody's taking notes. All right? All right, there's going to be an award, a prize for whoever gets the most points. Okay, Fanny, New City, New York, lawyer, four years older than me. Then they had Fanny's younger brother, Matt, or in Russian, Mitya or Matfie, which is what my parents would call me. A anybody here Russian by any chance? All right. I don't know your name, though. It just says user. So I, I don't know. I don't know what that means. But, but anyway, yeah. it's nice to me. What is it? It's Naftali. Naftali. Okay, now I know. That's, that's easier to pronounce for some reason than user. <laughs> All right. Anyway, Naftali, nice to meet you. Ochim Priyatno, if you understand Russian. So anyway, um, we weren't given any type of Jewish upbringing whatsoever. After all, my parents could only give us what they themselves had. And so, for example, a lot of the things that people would consider to be just basics of Jewish upbringing, I didn't have. So, for instance, 
the words Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur may as well have been Chinese to me because I never heard those words before, let alone going to synagogue on those days. Um, going to Hebrew school didn't exist. Uh, having a bar mitzvah, nothing. So all of the basics, I just didn't have them. And again, it was nothing against my parents. It's just they didn't know any, any better. Um, that my parents sent us to a public school, and it just so happened that that public school district at the time had the highest crime and drug rate for a pretty large radius. And as happens to many young people, I got caught up in the wrong crowd. And from a young age, I was already getting into a lot of trouble. Um, so for example, at 10 years old, I already started smoking cigarettes. At 11 years old, I started with drugs. I started with, with pot, marijuana. And it started with just, you know, trying it out and eventually got to be more and more and more. And then it got to be, you know, other things eventually. Um, my mother, for some reason, she uh, decided that maybe, just maybe, it would be a good idea to switch me out of this public school and to send me to a private school. The problem was that my parents didn't know of a good private school to send me to. But they had these family friends who also were from Russia, and they decided that they wanted to send their kids to a local Jewish day school. And the mother of this family spoke to my mother and said, look, it might be a good idea to send Matt, Mitya, to the, uh, the Jewish day school that my kids go to. My mother didn't know anything from a Jewish school. She said, Jewish school? Why? I mean, she didn't know what that was. But she thought, you know, just for safety's sake, it would be a good consideration to send me over there. The problem was that I had zero interest whatsoever in going to a Jewish school. Come on, I have better things to do. All of my friends are in the public school. What am I gonna, what do I need a Jewish school for, please? And the good news for me was that my father, believe it or not, happened to be on my side. Not because of anything malicious, but just because it was the fear of the unknown, which is so natural to parents. You don't want to send your kids somewhere where you don't know what's going on. So he was hesitant to send me to a Jewish school. And in fact, at one point during this conversation with my mother, conversation, argument, discussion, sometimes there's a fine line. But at one point, my father said, the last thing that I need is a rabbi in my house. God has a funny sense of humor. So they're having this discussion, this argument back and forth. My mother's saying he's going to the Jewish school. My father's saying, no, he's not. And they're going back and forth. And as is the custom in my home, and I believe it's an age-old Jewish custom. Maybe it's the custom with some of you guys, but you don't have to admit anything publicly. But in my family, when the mother and the father have a discussion slash argument back and forth, then who generally has the last say? Uh, Sylvia is raising her hand. Okay. So we're all on the same page. Is that right? Are we really all on this? Are we a Jewish crowd? We're all on the same page? That's a miracle. Amazing. <laughs> so a mother generally in my family has the last say. But like a good Jewish mother, my mother always found a way to make my father feel like he had the last say. So they're having this discussion back and forth. My mother's saying he's going to the Jewish school. My father's saying, no, he's not. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And finally, after enough back and forth, my father says, you know what? Fine, fine. He'll go to the Jewish school. But under one condition. So here's the last say. Under one condition. What's the condition? The second that I see that Matt is starting to become observant in any way, shape, or form. We're taking him out of there. He's going back to the public school, and that's the end of it. Deal? Deal. So I'm off to the, the Jewish school. And the truth is, my father, honestly, had absolutely nothing to worry about because I was not interested. I was checked out. This is my eighth grade yearbook photo here. As you can see, I was uh, not so interested. I was pretty cool with the sideways red hat. You see, I'm still trying to figure out how to get the black hat to the side, but it doesn't look quite as cool for some reason. Still working on it. But anyway, in eighth grade, 
this was my yearbook album. And it's, I, I had like no interest. I was the type, I'm sure nobody knows any kids like this, that when you would teach me something, it would go in one ear and out the other. And if by some miracle, something ended up landing in between my ears, you know, in the brain, then it was almost guaranteed that whatever I was told, I would do the opposite because I was just a rebel at heart. And in my eighth grade yearbook, there being that it's a graduating class, there was a page where it was a page of awards that everybody got to vote for each other for certain awards. And then it was printed in the yearbook and you would find out who won which awards. So in that eighth grade yearbook, I happened to have won two of the awards, which I was very proud of, but my parents not so much. So what were the two awards? Number one was I won Class Clown. Woo! Yeah, I was very proud of that one. Much nachis for my parents. Pride and joy. Not really. But the second one was, and I believe it was a unanimous decision, was that I won least likely to become a... Come on, anybody? A, a rabbi. A bunch of people. Sylvia, Gerilyn, five points for each of you. Very good. The Snyders, I think, said it also. Very, very good. I hope somebody's keeping score. All right. The Paltiels also. <laughs> very good. So... My family then, we got invited to our first ever Shabbat meal. Now, how many people here have been to a Shabbat meal before? Either a dinner or a lunch. Okay, how about you, Rabbi? Okay, whew, I got nervous for a second. Okay, Baruch Hashem. Rabbi Paltiel has been to a Shabbos meal. <laughs> Very good. So we got invited to our first ever Shabbos meal. And I have to tell you, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. The first Shabbat meal that I ever went to, I thought was an extremely strange experience. There was a lot going on over there that I just was not used to seeing. So it was very, very strange. And I'll walk you through the experience just so that you get a little feel for how strange it was. And maybe some of you will be able to relate. So I show up at the house and, you know, they welcome us in. Everybody's super warm and welcoming, as I'm sure is the case when you go to the Paltiels for Shabbos. God willing, Corona will all go away soon because for Rabbi and Rebetzin not to have guests over is like going through withdrawal. It's like the most painful thing. So God willing, we'll be able to do it soon. But anyway, we came into the house. Everybody was extremely warm and welcoming. And then they say, okay, all the ladies come. We're going to do this thing called lighting the candles. So all the ladies go over to this buffet that's set up with candles. They start lighting the candles. And all of a sudden, they start waving their hands like this and covering their eyes and mumbling something. And apparently, it's because it's a time when lighting the Shabbat candles, you can pray for anything. And that's actually the case every Friday evening when lighting the Shabbat candles. The gateways of heaven are wide open to our prayers. And you can pray for anything at that time. But what did I know at that time? All I saw was this and this and mumbling and then they say okay now we're gonna make our way over to the table but don't sit down yet that's interesting why would you go to the table and not sit down well because we have to do this thing called kiddush first okay interesting never heard of that before so now we're around the table and the person at the head of the table starts pouring into his silver cup this with the wine and he's pouring and he's pouring and he's pouring and eventually it overflows and it spills all over the table and apparently he does it on purpose because the wine symbolizes blessings and we always want our blessings to overflow so now there's blessings flowing freely all over the table excellent then he says a blessing in a language i don't understand and then we pass around these little cups of wine or grape juice we finally sit down have our little cup of wine and now it's time for the meal right Wrong, because first we have to make our way into the kitchen for some ritual hand washing that dates back to the times of the temple. So in the kitchen, you're going to find by the sink a very interesting looking cup. It's a cup that has not one handle, but two handles. I've never seen a cup with two handles before. I've seen a cup with one handle. It's called a mug, but a cup with two handles? What's the point? Well, that's because when you wash your hands, you wash on the right hand three times, then on the left hand 
three times, you do the hokey pokey and you turn your mouth and you say this blessing and then you can't talk until you have this delicious smelling challah that was in the room that we were in originally that I've been smelling this whole time, but it keeps getting pushed off because of all of these rituals. So now I do this Jewish hokey pokey. Somebody helps me with the blessing. And we're not allowed to talk. So now we're on our way back to the table. And then I'm introduced to a whole new language that I never heard before. What's this language? It's the hmm language. Hmm-hmm. Why? Because you can't talk, but you can hmm-hmm to each other. And if you can't get the message across with a series of hmm-hmms, then people start acting things out. All of a sudden, it becomes like a massive game of charades where people are acting on their way back to the table. And I'm thinking to myself, what's going on over here? I'm this regular American Russian kid. What is this? We make our way over to the table, and finally, you have these chalas with the cover over it. And and the person uncovers the chalas and takes this big butcher knife and says this blessing and starts to chop it in half. And he's shredding it into shreds and dipping it into salt and passing it around to everybody. Now we have the challah. We're allowed to talk. And finally, we're about to start the meal. Baruch Hashem. That's a real Baruch Hashem because I've been waiting for this meal for a long time. So the meal starts and then the strangest part happens. For me, this was the strangest part. What was it? At a certain point in the meal, all of a sudden, everybody broke out in song. They just started singing. And for me, a regular Russian-American kid, we don't just sit around a family table and just start breaking out into jingles. It just doesn't happen. Look, I had many Thanksgiving meals before with family sitting around the table and this big stuffed turkey. and every We don't just start singing songs with each other. But over here at this meal, we started singing a song. And the words to the songs were the strangest part. What were the words? You could just imagine the karaoke to the songs. It went something like this. And everybody starts clapping. Gerilyn clapping. Hey, there we go. And everybody's putting their arms around each other, which is kind of hard to do on Zoom, but we're going to try it anyway. And they're standing up. And I'm sitting over here at this meal, and I am this regular American Russian kid, and I'm thinking, what planet did I just land on, and how did I end up here? But I'm going to share something with you that was going on during that meal that at that time, I was way too cool to admit. I would have never admitted it to anybody because I had to put on this tough guy front because I was this cool, thuggish kid. And I just would not have shared this with anybody. But something happened inside of me at that meal that I think about to this day almost every single day because it taught me such a profound and powerful life lesson that I try to actually internalize every day. And so what, what happened, what was going on inside of me? So what happened was I was thinking that this really is a very out there experience. This is really strange. But there's something actually really, really, really beautiful about it. Maybe it's the family atmosphere. Maybe it's the kids running around. Maybe it's the feeling of togetherness. Maybe it's the electronics that are, I don't know what it is, but there's something really beautiful about this experience. And maybe, just maybe, there's a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a possibility that one day when I grow up, and I get married, and I have a, kids of my own, and I have my own home, that maybe, just maybe, this is going to be a little bit of what my home will look like when I grow up on a Friday evening. 
And sure enough, you fast forward several years and Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, you take a look at my house, a glimpse into my home on a Friday evening, and this is exactly the scene that you'll see with the candles and with the waving and with the eyes and with the mumbling and with the spilling the wine all over the table and with the little kiddish cups that go around and with the two-handled cup and the Jewish hokey pokey and the mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and the acting things out and the butcher knife with the challah and the passing it around and the and the whole thing maybe just maybe that's what it's going to be and that's what it turned into and the lesson that it taught me was this that we can never ever ever judge a book by its cover because if somebody would have seen me there at that meal they would have said, oh, why waste your time on this person? He doesn't care. He's not interested. Invite somebody who's going to be a little bit more into it. But that's because they had no idea what was going on inside of me. Inside of me, if they would have known that there was something stirring inside of me that was so powerful, they would have never thought along those lines. And what it shows me is that we all have opportunities in our lives to share a mitzvah experience with another Jew. That we all are leaders. We all have the ability to give another Jew an opportunity to do a mitzvah, regardless if they're interested, if they're not interested, if they're going to scoff at you when you invite them, it makes no difference what the results are. Our job is to put in the effort. As we say, we are in the effort business and Hashem, God is in the results business. Our job is to give somebody an opportunity to do a mitzvah. When things settle down to say, hey, I would love to have you over for a Friday evening for a Shabbat meal. Hey, would you like to come to uh, one of the rabbi's classes with me? Hey, you've got to meet the rabbi and the rabbits and the paltils. They're so amazing. They're warm, welcoming. They make you feel like a million bucks. You got to check out the rabbi's Zoom classes. They're very, very inspiring. I just watched your pre-Shabbos Fabrengen, by the way, with Maishi Rappaport. Excellent. That yeah, very, very good stuff. <laughs> not, not, it was already Shabbos for me, so I watched it on Sunday. But <laughs> anyway, it was uh, to, to give another Jew an opportunity to do a mitzvah. And that opportunity and that invitation might just be that little bit of light and positivity that that person needs in their life right there and then at that moment. And who is the one to share it with them? each and every one of us. So with that, I'm going to share another song with you guys, if that's okay. What do you say, Alan? Another song? It's kosher? All right. Baruch Hashem. Okay, so I'm going to do another song. By the way, these songs are from uh, my CD, which you can actually get for free through an app called Spotify. If you remind me at the end, I'll put the name of the album in the chat so you can find it easily. But it's 12 songs that each one is a Jewish theme and has, you know, background music, etc. So I'll do this one with the background music. It's a very apropos song because... It's about Shabbos, the gift of Shabbos. So just give me one second, sorry. All right. And I'm going to share my screen again as well so that you, anybody who... Uh, would rather read along with the lyrics, you could do that too. All right, you guys see the screen? All right, excellent. And now I'll start the music, and we are ready to rock and roll, or to rap and roll. You guys hear it? All right, I know that Naftali is gonna clap along with me when I go like this, I know it. I know Alan will, I know Gerilyn for sure, I don't even have to ask, it's a given. Gerilyn with those Baruch Hashems, oh, got nothing to worry about. <laughs> I even have faith that Erwin is going, going to help, and Sylvia. Yeah? All right. And the Snyders for sure. Okay, here we go. 
Maybe we can even get Roberta to clap. How about that? On, on oh, she's knitting. Clapping. She's knitting. Sorry. Shabbos, we're clapping. When Shabbos comes, we know it's time for relaxing. Shabbos without it, it's we go. hard to imagine. Love Shabbos, let's keep on singing and dancing. On Shabbos, we're laughing. Shabbos, we're clapping. When Shabbos comes, we know it's time for relaxing. Shabbos without it, it's hard to imagine. Love Shabbos, let's keep on singing and dancing. On Shabbos, we meet up for a positive reason. Such a positive meeting. With a lot of deep meaning It's not even needed to wait for the holiday season Cause every single week we have a holiday weekend Thank God cause we need it Cause we're so head over heels We just went through the week Like dogs were chasing our tails Working to set up a deal Sit at our desks and we feel Is the week almost over? When can we get out of here? Get home and we know that Shabbos approaches We focus on what's real in life Without the hocus pocus Our goal is to notice Our families, our souls And the most important things that we know are the the closest see that the things that we feel that we need that can wait 24 hours because we don't really need that lean back relax focus on what's real and connect with each man and with Hashem because that's our real path. on Shabbos we're laughing Shabbos we're clapping when Shabbos comes we know it's time yes Roberta put the knitting down and she's clapping love Shabbos let's keep on singing and dancing on Shabbos we're laughing Shabbos we're clapping when Shabbos comes we know it's time for relaxing Shabbos without it, it's hard to imagine. Love Shabbos, let's keep on singing and dancing. At a point in our existence, Zadie yeah. used to make a kiddish. Uh -huh. Bubby used to bake and make yeah. the challahs That's in the kitchen. Right. Our vision is to live this, and yeah. this is our decision. Uh -huh. If we do these things today, we can connect with our tradition. You step into the Shabbos home, instantly feel the energy that steadily persisted through the decades and the centuries. Blessing us incredibly, we sing the holy medley. Shalom Aleichem and the rest of the Jewish melodies. Together we stand and make the kiddish and we drink some wine kiddish time now we say hamotzi and we sit and dine fish and wine dishes on the side then it's chicken time sing and laugh together as we get up and give lechimes wish we might live the type of life that we think is right sometimes the best way to find meaning is getting rid of night bring the bright light of shabbos candles in to live the life because the best way to fill our homes is with a little light on shabbos we're laughing shabbos we're clapping when shabbos comes we know it's time for relaxing shabbos without it it's hard to Imagine, love Shabbos. Let's Thank you, Alan. Yeah, on Shabbos, we're laughing. Shabbos, we're clapping. When Shabbos comes, we know it's time for relaxing. All right, now, Polly. It's hard to imagine. Love Shabbos. Let's keep on singing and dancing. When they came to the U.S., our grandparents went shopping for jobs. We're not allowed to take off for Shabbos. So from job to job, they went each Sunday to Friday. They knew that breaking Shabbos was not even an option. They opted to do this because they saw with greater clarity, saw all all they got was a gift from God as charity. They stopped their jobs on Shabbos just like their parents did. They knew that God was the cause of their prosperity. This wasn't a rarity, but it's hard to relate because the world around us tells us the opposite way. If we're off Saturday, think we're not getting paid, but a part of the faith is knowing God has his ways. If you haven't had the chance to have it, you can't imagine that in fact the impact that it has will keep on lasting. Take a stand and demand that we can and have to have it. Pass it down to our kids and grandkids. Kids, so they can pass it on Shabbos. We're laughing. Shabbos, we're clapping. When Shabbos comes, we know it's time for relaxing. Shabbos without it, it's hard to imagine. Love Shabbos, let's keep on singing and dancing. On Shabbos, we're laughing. Shabbos, we're clapping. When Shabbos comes, we know it's time for relaxing. Shabbos without it, it's hard to imagine. Love Shabbos, let's keep on singing and dancing. On Shabbos, we're laughing. Shabbos, we're clapping. When Shabbos comes, we know it's time for relaxing. Relaxing, Shabbos without it, it's hard to imagine. Love Shabbos, let's one more time. On Shabbos, we're laughing. Shabbos, we're clapping. When Shabbos comes, we know it's time for relaxing. Shabbos without it, it's hard to imagine. Love Shabbos, let's keep on singing and dancing. It's hard to imagine quite how fantastic Shabbos is. We're all just singing and dancing, sitting, relaxing, chilling and laughing to the rhythm. We're clapping, I keep clapping. It's hard to imagine quite how fantastic Shabbos is. We're all just singing and dancing, sitting, relaxing, chilling and laughing to the rhythm. We're clapping. I keep clapping. <laughs> Ha-kodosh <laughs> 
All right. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You guys are amazing. You guys are amazing. Is it getting warm in here? Or is it just me? Whoo. All right. All right. All right. So we're just getting warmed up here. We're just getting started. So I went off to high school and in high school, I got very, very involved in hip hop and rap. Um, I got involved in that whole scene. Um, just part of my journey. I was, I knew everything about rap, about hip hop, about every artist. I kind of looked at it as poetry to a rhythm. Although nowadays I work a lot with young people and I always tell them to stay far away from, from that uh, genre nowadays, the pop stuff, because it's very, very, very inappropriate. But again, that was just part of my journey. I was so involved in it that I'd started to write my own raps. And you know how it goes. You show it to a couple of people and a couple of people turns into a small group and then a small group turns into a bigger group. And eventually I found myself as part of a rap group, had a producer, spent a lot of time in recording studios, spent a lot of time performing and I uh, never made it to like a global or national scale or anything like that. But locally in the Philadelphia area where I grew up, it was pretty, pretty well known. I went off to college. I went to a place called Brandeis University. Anybody ever heard of it in, in the Boston area? Okay, very good. So it's in the Boston area, actually Waltham, Massachusetts. And when I went to college, I have to tell you, I was living the college dream. I was living the life. I really had it all, and I felt that I had it all. There was really nothing that I could dream or wish that I had that I didn't have because I had it all. So, for example... Um, I had a lot of friends. I was partying every night. I was um, somehow getting good grades in school, which uh, I believe is a miracle because, remember, I was doing drugs from when I was 11, and so I was still doing drugs at this point, but much more heavily. I was really high from morning to night, um, and uh, so I was also getting good grades. The other thing was, and I always tell people, you know, it goes without saying. I, I love when people say it goes without saying, but then they say it anyway. So it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway, that what I'm about to share is not to be taken as an example, obviously. You know, sometimes I speak to younger people. And I have to be very, very clear that I made a lot of mistakes in my life. And the parts that I'm about to share are, were big mistakes. Again, just a part of my journey. And so I, I wanted to go into business, but for whatever reason, Brandeis didn't offer a business major. So I took a close relative to business, which was economic. Economics. I studied economics when I was in college, and I wanted hands-on experience with business. So I started a business of my own. What was the business? Was that I was one of the campus drug dealers. So I was dealing the uh, pot on campus. So I had a lot of drugs, and I had a lot of money as well. So friends, parties, grades, drugs, money. I mean, I, I had it all. I really felt like I was living the life. But then three things took place that kind of changed the trajectory of my life. And um, I'm going to share those three things with you now. So number one was that although I had everything and I, I really was living the dream, for some really, really weird reason, I um, felt a little bit empty. This is more what I looked like when I was in college. Um, I felt very, very empty inside. And it really bothered me because it made no sense to me. If I felt empty and I understood why I felt empty, I was missing something or something like that, it wouldn't bother me so much. But the fact that I had everything, I should have felt full, right? I should have felt complete. So where's this emptiness coming from? And that was really, really, really bothering me. The second thing that happened was, and uh, to be honest, it was pretty traumatic. And it's still difficult to speak about it to this day. It's one of those things you never really get over it completely. So what happened? So a group of my friends, we got our hands on a certain drug called mushrooms, or shrooms, magic mushrooms, whatever. There are many different names. And what it does is you have these shrooms and it makes you hallucinate. It makes you see things that are not reality. And I always tell people there's no such thing as an innocent drug. I know a lot of people disagree, especially in California, that uh, where it's, it's much more loose and relaxed with drugs. But 
I always say that I really believe there's no such thing as an innocent drug because a drug is only as innocent as the person you get it from or the supplier that they get it from. Why? Because they could do something which is called lacing the drug, which essentially means sprinkling chemicals into the drug. And um, then you have some, an experience called a bad trip, which is the worst experience that anybody that I ever had and that anybody could ever imagine, really. It's, it's the way I describe it is it's like a nightmare that you can't wake up from. It just keeps going and going and going. And you can't sleep through it because it's a stimulant, so it keeps you awake. And sometimes it can last from 2 to 10 hours. And you can imagine how long 10 hours feels in a nightmare. It's, it's an eternity. It's it's horrible, horrible experience. So anyway, back to the story. A group of my friends, we got our hands on um, a batch of mushrooms. It's important to note that I did not supply them. I only dealt with uh, pot. And you'll see why that's an important detail in a moment but anyway sure enough we all had these shrooms and they were laced and sure enough we all had a really 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 bad trip the word bad just doesn't even do it justice it was it was terrible it was horrific and it lasted somewhere from eight to ten hours i believe you kind of lose track of time when you're in that state but it was somewhere from eight to ten hours so it was it was a big one and a really really powerful one and without getting too graphic what happened was, was one of the people who also had that batch of shrooms, um, he didn't survive the night. He ended up taking his own life. It was a very, very gruesome, gruesome situation. It made national news. It was uh, a big deal in Massachusetts and the state news. It was a huge deal at Brandeis on our campus. And it was the biggest deal, I believe, amongst the other people who had those shrooms, who had that experience. And after things kind of settled down a little bit, I asked myself, you know, I thought to myself, me and this guy, we had a lot in common. We're pretty much the same age. He was one year older than me. We're both at Brandeis University. We're both economics majors. We're both Jewish. He happened to be Jewish as well. Um, we both had the same batch of shrooms. We both had very, very similar experiences. But there's one huge difference between us. And that is that for some reason, and I don't know why, but for some reason, I'm alive and he's not. And it could have very, very easily been the opposite. God forbid, God forbid, it could have been the opposite. And I thought to myself, if God forbid that was me, then would I have been satisfied with the life that I lived until that point? And the answer that I gave myself was a resounding no. I wouldn't have been satisfied. But I didn't understand why. Why wouldn't I have been satisfied? After all, I'm living a pretty good life, right? I'm having a great time, and life is all about having fun, right? I'm, I've got good grades. I'm in a good college. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah, I'm misbehaving here and there, but whatever. I'm not getting caught. It's not such a big deal. Um, so why wouldn't I have been satisfied? And that started to bother me. By the way, I was sharing this story one time when I was in Lake Worth, Florida um, at, a, at a Shabbaton. And as I started sharing this part about the shrooms, a little boy walked in. Unfortunately, it was bad timing. I always ask parents to take their kids out of the room, you know. I don't want them to hear it. But a little boy walked into the room during this part about the shrooms, and he looked at his parents, and he said, Mom, Dad, I'm never having mushroom pizza ever again. <laughs> he said, oh, it's a different kind of mushrooms. Don't worry about it. But but anyway, so that was the second thing that happened. The third thing that happened was that I came to a realization. I came to a powerful realization as follows. I thought to myself that I, I realized that everything that I was doing until that point was for something that may or may not happen at some point in the future. So, for example, in high school, I was getting good grades so that I could get into a good college. In college, I'm getting good grades so that I could get into a good graduate school. In grad school, I'm going to get good grades so that I could get a good career, so that I could earn a good living, so that I could buy a big house and a fancy car, so that I can uh, retire early, so that I can go on a lot of vacations, so that, so that, so that, so that. And I realized that most of the people 
that I knew actually were living their entire lives that way, waiting for that elusive thing that may or may not happen at some point in the future. And I realized I knew people in their 80s, even their 90s, who are still like looking forward, waiting for that thing. And I thought to myself, that's crazy. I, I don't want to live my life that way. Just waiting for the, something that may or may not happen in the future. What about right now? Like, there's got to be a way to make right now count, to make right now meaningful and special. I didn't know what the answer was, but at least I had the question. And for us Jews, very often the question is more important than the answer. We love questions. In fact, you will make the Rabbi Rebetzin's day if you ever call them with a question about anything Jewish or about life. It'll make their day. It'll make their week. That's what it's about. It's about asking questions, even if you don't always get the answers. So at that time, I was asking the questions. But even though I didn't know the answer. So these are the three things, the feeling of emptiness and the friend who passed away and would I have been satisfied? And the answer was no. And the realization that about living for the future in the meantime, what about now? So, you know, sometimes you experience a lot of different things in life and you just need to speak to somebody about it. You know, a friend, a relative, a spouse, a rabbi, etc. So at that time, I had a best friend whose name was Jason Sugarman. This is a picture of the two of us at our high school graduation. And we were two peas in a pod. We did everything together, all the same interests, all the same hobbies, all the same drugs, all the same, everything. And I felt like I just needed to speak to Jason. The problem was, was that Jason was at this crazy place in Israel called Yeshiva. Oh. You know, like a Jewish educational institution. And that made no sense to me. Because in my mind, yeshiva was essentially a room that was full of old men with like long white beards sitting over big dusty books that when you turn the page, it's like a cloud of dust pops out. And that was my vision of yeshiva. And Jason and yeshiva just did not go together. There's no way my best friend Jason is in a place like that. But I was able to convince my parents to let me go and visit Jason during my spring break from college. So I went to visit him. And first of all, I saw that my vision of yeshiva was totally off. He happened to be in a yeshiva that was full of kids just like us who didn't necessarily grow up with much of a Jewish education, if any, and just knew they were Jewish and wanted to learn more about it in a very non-judgmental environment, etc. So that was pretty interesting to see. And then finally, I had the opportunity to open up to Jason and to share everything with him, this emptiness, this friend who passed away, this thing with living in the future. I went on and on and on and on. And finally, after I finished, first of all, it felt really good to get it off my chest. But then after I was all done, I'll never forget it. Jason looked me in the eyes and he said in his eloquent English, he said, dude, you just don't get it. And I said, dude, you're right. I have no idea what you're talking about. He says, you just don't get it. I said, I agree. What are you saying? So he said, you know a lot about a lot of different things. You know a lot about economics and how to get good grades and uh, drugs and rap and da 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 da. He says, but you don't know anything about the most important thing in your life. And now I was like really confused. I was like, what are you saying? Could you just say it already? So he said, you don't know anything about yourself. And now I was really, really confused. And he said, you know nothing about who you are as a Jew. And when he said those words, wow, I have to tell you, it hit me like a ton of bricks because he was absolutely right. I, had, I didn't know the first thing about who I was as a Jew. And after I like processed it for a little bit and Jason, I, I said to him, so what do I do about it? You're, you're right. I can't argue against that. I, I don't know anything about being Jewish. I can't prove that I do because it just wouldn't be true. But what do I do about it? So he said, I'll give you my advice. He, he's a straight shooter to this day. He's a straight shooter. And he said, this is what I suggest. 
He said, I think that you should take off a couple of months from school and you come and join me here in yeshiva and you learn about who you are as a Jew. And when he said that, I said, what are you talking about? I can't just take time off from college. Nobody does that. You go to college, you finish in four years. What do you mean push it off? I, I, nobody does that. It's not normal. He said, look, maybe you're right. Maybe it's not normal. Most people don't do it. You're right. He says, but with everything in life, you always have to weigh the pluses and minuses, the pros and cons when you're making a decision. He's very, very persuasive, as you'll see. I still think that he should have become a lawyer to this day. But what he said was as follows. He said, you have to weigh the pluses and minuses. He says, if you come here, you take a couple of months off, you come here, what's the worst case scenario? What's the worst possible thing that could happen? He said, the worst thing is you'll come for a couple of months. It's not going to speak to you. You're going to go back to college and you're going to finish maybe one semester later. That's the worst thing that could possibly happen. He says, but what's the best case scenario? So he said, the best case scenario is you're going to come. It is going to speak to you. And what you're going to learn during your yeshiva experience is going to give you the tools that you need to live a life full of meaning, purpose, identity, and happiness, which is going to last you for the rest of your life. I don't know. Pretty, pretty solid argument, I thought. And I couldn't, I couldn't argue. Yeah, the, tr the truth is to wait a couple of months that I might be missing versus a life full of uh, meaning and happiness sounds pretty good to me. I should give it a shot. So now I had to contact my parents and I had to convince them to let me go. So I reached out to my parents and I didn't start with yeshiva. First, I said, you know what? I would love to go to Hebrew University in Jerusalem for my junior semester abroad. You know, during your junior year, you have the option to go and study in another country to learn about their culture. So I'll go and study in Hebrew University another college. I wouldn't be losing any time, etc. So my parents were totally on board with that. But then once I had my foot in the door in Jerusalem, I said, Mama, Papa, remember they're Russian, Mama, Papa, why do I have to go all the way to Jerusalem just to go to another college? I'm in college in Boston. I have to go all the way to Jerusalem just for another college. Maybe if I'm in Jerusalem anyway, I should do something which is unique to Jerusalem, like go to yeshiva. Apparently, I thought every yeshiva in the world was in Jerusalem. And apparently, my parents thought so also because they were actually surprisingly on board and they were fine with me going. So the fall came around and I was sitting on the airplane ready to take off for Tel Aviv in Israel, Ben Gurion Airport. And I remember sitting there with a big afro and I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to go with a completely open mind. If it speaks to me, great. And if not, I'm back to square one. I reached into my pocket. I had a little blue suede yarmulke that I probably got at a bar mitzvah somewhere. And I remember putting it on top of my big afro. <laughs> and from that point on, a yamulka never came off of my head. I went to yeshiva and I started learning things about being Jewish that I never learned before. And I was blown away. So for example, I learned that just like we have a body and it's important to feed our bodies, we also have this thing called a soul. And it's equally important, if not more important, to feed and nourish our souls. Well, how do we nourish our souls? Well, we have this whole slew of mitzvahs that every time you do any little mitzvah, it is giving nourishment to the soul. Every time we do a little bit of Torah study, it's nourishing the soul. Every time we read an article on Chabad.org or do a kind deed for another person, it is nourishing the soul. And then boom, the light bulb started to go off. Of course I'm going to feel empty. Remember point number one? Of course I'm going to feel empty. I've spent every waking moment of every day focusing on, well, how am I going to feed the desires of my body? And never spent a single moment thinking about, well, how am I going to nourish the needs of my soul? So of course I'm going to feel empty. I am ignoring this critical component of my being. 
And that also tied into point number two, this friend who passed away, and if it was me, would I have been satisfied? The answer was no. Obviously, I wouldn't have been satisfied because, again, I've been neglecting this critical part of myself. And then I learned what a mitzvah is, right? We all know what a mitzvah is. A mitzvah is a commandment. So let me paint the scenario for you. Somebody comes up to me and says, hey, I've got an offer that you can't refuse. Ooh, sounds intriguing, right? I have 613. That's the number of mitzvahs in the Torah. I have 613 rules and regulations, do's and don'ts, things you're not allowed to do and things you have to do. Will you accept them? I would say, <laughs> yeah, right, 613 rules, do's and don'ts, please. Why would I ever want to be tied down by so many rules? I want to be free. I don't want to be tied down. But then I learned that the word mitzvah not only means commandment, but it also means connection. Because every time we do any little mitzvah, we are creating an eternal connection between our soul and infinity. So now let's go back to that scenario. Somebody approaches me and says, hey, I've got an offer you can't refuse. Oh, sounds intriguing. I've got 613. Same beginning, but a different ending. I've got 613 tips about how you can connect your soul to infinity and in so doing, transcend all of your natural limitations and live a life full of meaning and happiness. Will you accept these 613 tips of connection? I would say, whoa, only 613? Why stop short? Come on, keep them coming. Bring it on. I would love these connections. Unbelievable, this is beautiful. And so I learned that every time we do a mitzvah, we're creating one of these connections. So for example, I can take a little coin and put it into a tzedakah box. And I can, by doing that, I am taking that coin and I am infusing that coin with holiness. Not only that, but I am infusing my arm with holiness. Not only that, the box that I'm putting the coin into is becoming infused with holiness. Not only that, but the work that I put into earning that coin becomes infused with holiness. And I'm creating a domino effect of holiness that it extends to the entire world. Through what? Through a coin in a box. Wow. And I can take these leather straps, right? to fill in and I can wrap them around my arm. And when I do that, I'm infusing the leather with holiness. Not only that, the cow that the leather came from becomes infused with holiness. It's a whole new meaning of holy cow. Not only that, but the farm that the cow was raised on becomes infused with holiness. Not only that, the farmer who fed the cow becomes infused with holiness. And there is this ripple effect of holiness that extends to the entire cosmos, the entire universe, through what? Through leather straps on my arm, unbelievable. And that applies to every single mitzvah. I light Shabbat candles on Friday evening. How far does that light extend? To the end of the dining room, right? Wrong. It extends everywhere to the entire universe. And here's the kicker. Ready? The kicker is this. When does that take place? When does it happen? It does not take place in the future. It does not take place next year when I'm 90, when I'm 80, tomorrow in five minutes, it takes place right here and right now. Because every moment I have hundreds of opportunities to make this moment count, to make this moment infinite, to make this moment special. And a mitzvah is something that can never, ever, ever be taken away. Everything else in my life, God forbid, can be taken away. My money, my health, my car, my job, whatever it is. A mitzvah that I do today, I have forever. Nobody could take it away because it's between me and God. And so throughout the course of that year, I am like so into it. All of my questions are getting answered. It makes sense why I feel empty. I have my answer to how I can make this moment meaningful without needing to wait to the future. And during that year, I really started to make a lot of changes in my life. I took my learning very seriously. I studied a lot. I stopped doing drugs. 
by the end of that year, Baruch Hashem. Um, and it became very clear at the end of that year that there was no way that I could go back to Brandeis. Um, my whole group of friends was over there, my drugs, my reputation, etc. So I ended up transferring to a college in Manhattan called Yeshiva University, and I finished my degree in economics there two years later. Um, while I was at Yeshiva University, I started to date this girl named Rachel. And Rachel also did not grow up observant. She grew up in a place called Delaware. Should sound familiar. We'll be back to that soon. She grew up in a place called Delaware, where her family was influenced by the Chabad couple there, um, which we'll speak about soon. But anyway, I started to date Rachel, and it was clear that we would end up spending our lives together. We were at that stage in the relationship. And one time we were walking together to Shul, to synagogue on a Shabbat morning. And we were having one of these discussions that young couples have about, you know, what, what do we want to do with our lives, etc. So as we were walking, I was thinking to myself, what did I want to do for a career? I honestly have no idea. I studied economics, but for some reason, I just don't see myself being passionate enough about economics to dedicate my life to being an economist. I know there are many people who probably are passionate about it. It just wasn't for me. It didn't float my boat. So Rachel looked at me and she said, well, what are you passionate about? And I thought for a moment and I thought, and I said, you know what? The only thing that I could think of right now that I'm really passionate about is that I love learning Torah and sharing it with others. And she said, so then you should become a rabbi. I said, oh, Rabbi, come on, me, Rabbi, you know me, you know where I came from, Rabbi, please, come on. Most rabbis, they grow up with it from birth, even before birth, when they're still in their mother's womb, their mother's singing Shema to them in, bell, in, in utero. Come on, Rabbi, please, you know where I was just a year ago. But she didn't think it was very funny, and she kept a straight face, and she said, look, if it's something that you're really passionate about, then you'll find a way to become a rabbi, to make it happen. And it was at that moment that we decided that there's nothing that we would rather do with our lives than dedicate our lives to being shluchim, emissaries of the Rebbe, a Chabad couple, a Chabad rabbi and Rebetzin, dedicating our lives to bringing that hug that that rabbi gave me all the way in the beginning so many years earlier and to extend that hug to as many people as possible, showing them the warmth, the beauty, and the love of Yiddishkeit, of Judaism, and the pride that we should all have in being Jews. And there's nothing I would rather do than that. I'm going to become a rabbi. I have no idea how it's going to happen. But come what may, through thick and through thin, I'm going to be a rabbi. We're going to be a Chabad couple. We're going to find a community that's naive enough to take us, and we are going to rock the house. So anyway, I ended up, after going to YU and finishing my degree in economics there, I went to a yeshiva in North Jersey called Morristown Yeshiva, the Rabbinical College of America where I spent a couple of years. I took my learning extremely seriously. After all, I had a lot of catching up to do. I was often the first one in the study hall and the last one to leave because I knew that I you know, was getting a really, really late start. So after, after a couple of years, I ended up getting what's called smicha, my rabbinic ordination. And at that point, I became a rabbi, Baruch Hashem. And now I have to find a community to go to. So we actually got an offer to go to a community in North Jersey. Um, and now that we had an offer, we thought maybe this is a good opportunity to look into our options. As I mentioned, Rachel, who became my wife, now she goes by Rachel. I haven't called her Rachel in years and years, but back then that's what she went by. Um, so she comes from this place called Delaware. And her family, as I mentioned, was influenced by the Chabad couple known as the Vogels in Delaware. So we reached out to them and we thought, you know, let's offer to go to, to possibly go there. Maybe we could build the youth community, make a Hebrew school, a teen program, a camp. They didn't have any of that going on at the time. So we reached out to them. We wrote this long email offering our services and um, 
expecting them to get back to us in a while. After all, it's a big decision. But we uh, sent the email and we checked our inbox the next morning. I believe it was the AOL days. Remember those days? You've got mail. Remember that? I think it was in those days. It was 10 years ago. So maybe it was after those days, actually. So anyway, in the inbox, there was a response from Rabbi Vogel the very next morning. And he said, this sounds wonderful. Um, come down to Delaware. We'll meet. We'll just make sure that it works out. But it sounds like it could really be great. We drove the two and a half hours from Morristown down to Delaware. We had the meeting. It was fantastic. It looked like it was going to be a win, win, win. It was great for them. It was great for us. It was great for the community. We went to the oil, the holy resting place of the Lubavitcher Rebbe to make it official and we were on our way to Delaware and that took place 10 years ago so we've been in Delaware now for 10 years and I have to tell you that we honestly could not imagine being any happier than we are we feel like we are so blessed like we are living the dream that we could have never even dreamt of there's nothing else in the world that we would rather be doing. And, you know, people ask, but weren't you so happy back then when you were in college? I said it myself. I was living the dream. But now I realize that actually I wasn't happy back then. I had a lot of pleasure, but I wasn't necessarily happy. Now, a lot of times people confuse pleasure and happiness. But there's actually a big difference, and they can actually be mutually exclusive. You can have a lot of pleasure without necessarily being happy, and you could have a lot of happiness without necessarily having all the pleasures in the world. Because true happiness can only come from a place where you're living a life which is in accordance with the inner needs of your soul. And as long as you're living in accordance with the needs of your soul, one little mitzvah at a time, that's where true happiness comes from. We, we, we don't have to travel too far for happiness. All we have to do is travel within and dig deeper and deeper, and we will find this beautiful treasure house of happiness. And uh, as I like to put it, I went from high to chai. I went from being high to being truly alive to being chai, and uh, I couldn't be more happy. Now, you know, sometimes at the end of a documentary, you have the postscript where you go through the whole cast of characters, and it tell you, Tell, it tells you where everybody is today. So right now I'm going to quickly just show you pictures of everybody and there's a big surprise ending at the end. So make sure you're holding on to your seats, okay? I don't want anybody to fall over and sue me. Okay, here we go. So I'm just going to share my screen. All right, this here, everybody sees the screen? All right, this here is my dear wife, Rachel, who um, is is really amazing. She's a big, big inspiration, not only for me, but for many, many, many other people. She is also a speaker. She, she shares her story, um, which is very different than mine. And she's also a motivational speaker. She goes around speaking and, and really inspiring people. She's really, really amazing. She, she is my inspiration, actually, in many, many ways. We've been married now for 13 years, Baruch Hashem, and she's stuck with me all these years for some crazy reason. Um, another proof that God exists. So anyway, that is her, my wife, Rachel. Um, we have six beautiful children. We have two girls and then four boys. So we started with two girls, and now we're on a four-boy streak. Um, here's a little bit of a better look. Um, by the way, this is just two and a half months ago at our oldest daughter's Shoshi's Bat Mitzvah, where, which we had on Zoom um, because of the state of the world, but it was fantastic because hundreds of people could come that otherwise wouldn't have been able to. Anyway, so we have Shoshi who's 12 and then it's pretty much every two years, which makes it easy to remember how old they are. Baruch Hashem, God had mercy on us. So this is Shoshi who's 12. This is Layla who's 10. This is Chezi who's eight. This is Yassi who's six. Mendy, who's turning four, and Zalmi, who is turning two. So I want everybody to please give a blessing that by the time we get off of this Zoom call, they will all be snoring in their beds. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right. <laughs> Very good. So... 
we started a program called C Team um, in in Delaware. We started a few years ago, and this is our group at the International C Team Shabbaton in New York. Um, a few years ago, we won two trophies, two out of three won. trophies. We won uh, International Chapter of the Year, and we won Male Leader of the Year. So that was very exciting. Eight years ago, we started a Hebrew school, and um, it started with eight kids. And this past year, we finished with 43 kids, Baruch Hashem. So that's uh, very, very exciting. We started a camp five years ago called Camp Ganizi, which we just finished um, a week and a half ago. Uh, this year, obviously, was very different than previous years, but we made it happen, and it was, it was wonderful. So you remember my sister, right? How many years older than me is she? Four. Sylvia has five points. All right. The Snyders have five points. Alan. Okay. Good. Roberta. Very good. We're paying attention. What does she do for a living? Lawyer. Lawyer. Very good. And uh, where does she live? New City. New City. Very good. And what's her name? That's a Danny. Whoa. You guys are amazing. Wow. 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 Can you guys have a training seminar for my community, please? Sure. How to pay attention to the rabbi. That would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway, here's Fanny um, with her husband, Elon, who is a Russian-Israeli Jew. And these are their two beautiful children, Shia and Aliyah. I'm very, very close with my sister. Um, we're very, very supportive of each other. Uh, people ask, well, is your sister religious? And my answer always is, the word religious in Chabad is somewhat of a curse word because we don't believe in a religious, not religious, observant, not observant. A Jew is a Jew is a Jew, period, and we're family and that's it. So in, from the conventional sense, you wouldn't say that she's religious, but the job of each and every one of us is to grow a little bit every day, little baby steps. And that's what she's doing, and that's amazing, and I'm super proud of her for that. Um, these are my grandparents on the outside, and then my mother, which leads me to the next slide, which is actually fresh, where my mother and grandmother went to visit my sister in New York for a Shabbos. And this is a picture of the four of them, light four generations lighting Shabbat candles together, which is just amazing. This is my grandmother, who is a Holocaust survivor. This is my mother, my sister, and my niece, Aliyah. And just when I see this picture, I get the chills, just knowing where my family was not too long ago. And now seeing four generations lighting candles together is pretty, pretty heartwarming for me. Um, my father, remember my father who said that the last thing that I need is a rabbi in my house? Mm -hmm. So how, do, how does he feel about it? So these are my parents here. And I'm very happy to say that my parents could not be more proud. Well, maybe they could be a little more proud after all my sister's a lawyer. So uh, yeah, I speak to my sister about, uh, my therapist about it, I'm sorry. Now, anyway, um, so they're very, very, very proud and excited about the life that we are leading. They are growing tremendously in their own Judaism. It's unbelievable. I mean, it really, really is incredible. To, nowadays, they keep kosher and, and Shabbat. My father wears a yarmulke and tzitzis everywhere that he goes, and he couldn't be more proud to be a Jew. Back then, it was just, again, the fear of the unknown. It was nothing malicious, but the more that they learned, the more that they understood how beautiful it was to live a life which is full of Judaism. So that's my parents. These are my in-laws. As I mentioned, my wife grew up in Delaware. Um, so her coming to Delaware was a homecoming. So her parents, my parents, we have a rule in our family. We're not allowed to say in-laws. So we, uh, they live just a few blocks away from us and we're very, very close with them. So that is that. And you remember my best friend, Jason, Mm -hmm. He was the one who said in his eloquent English, dude, you just don't get it. And he was the one who inspired me and persuaded me to go to yeshiva to learn about who I was. And so what's Jason up to nowadays? So I'm very excited to say that uh, we are still best friends. This is another picture of us from back in the day. This is 
a more recent picture of us. Uh, this is Jason, who now I call Shmuel or Shmulchik. And um, he is, we're very, very close. He lives in Jerusalem. He has a wife and three children. He has an Amazon business that he runs from there. And we're very, very, very close. But in addition to being best friends, Jason also happens to be my brother-in-law. Whoa, how did that happen? <laughs> so his younger sister is Rachel Flickstein, formerly known as Rachel Sugarman. And uh, so I married my best friend's younger sister, the same best friend who inspired me to go on this path in my life. And I have my entire life to thank him for now is literally my family. And now I am serving the community that he grew up in, in Delaware, working hand in hand with the Chabad rabbi in Rebetzin that inspired him and his family. So there are just many things that came full circle, which it's just uh, miracle after miracle. This is just a picture of me reading the Rebbe's blessing, the Rebbe's letter under his chuppah at his wedding. And um, last but not least, I want to just conclude by giving, we all, all owe a huge, huge debt of gratitude to our dear Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Sometimes I get a little bit, uh, a little bit emotional at this point, a little bit choked up. So bear with me if I do. <sighs> that I, I just have to thank the Rebbe every single day, every single moment of my life, for having the foresight and the vision for sending thousands and thousands of Rabbi Paltiels and Mrs. Paltiels and all of the rabbis and rebbitsons all over the entire world recognizing that the key to our survival and the key to us thriving as a people is reaching out and sharing the warmth, light, beauty, and love of being a Jew. And the Rebbe had that foresight which led to that rabbi giving little Matt a hug which led to me being where I am today. So we owe a huge thank you to the Rebbe. And I want to thank you guys in Laguna Niguel, California, for having me with you guys this evening. A thank you to the Rabbi and Rebbitson for inviting me. I'm looking forward to the day that we'll be able to meet in person. Maybe one of these days I'll come on a tour to California as a little speaking tour. And maybe I'll stop by to say hello. It would be my honor and pleasure to meet each and every one of you. <laughs> in person. So thank you very, very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, but if I could just ask one favor before I forget, is that now that we're family, I would love to get a family portrait with everybody, if that's okay with you. And it's not a family portrait in the conventional sense. But what we can do is that we can all, you know, smile for the camera. Anybody who has their cameras off, you're invited to turn them on if you are feeling up to it. It would be really amazing. If not, it's all good. Don't, no pressure. But uh, what we could do is maybe take two pictures, one with a thumbs up and one with a Baruch Hashem. Does that sound like a plan? All right. So, oh, hello, everybody. <laughs> so let's start with the thumbs up. You can use two fingers. I'm just going to do one because I need the other hand to do the screenshot, and I still haven't figured out how to do it with my foot. Okay, here we go. Ready? One, two, three. All right. And now a Baruch Hashem. Baruch, Baruch Hashem. Hashem. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Mutti. Wow. You left us inspired left me in tears, <laughs> uplifted. And um, I can't thank you enough, Rabbi Mati, for sharing your heartfelt experience, your journey. And um, I know I'm inspired, as is my wife, and I'm sure everybody that tuned in tonight and everybody who's going to listen later on. I want to just mention that you know, we've talked about it so much in this community over the years. We each have our personalities. We each have our struggles. We each have our journeys that Hashem puts us on. And we just heard a story 
of a unique character that once what he was inspired, Rabbi Mati was inspired to change course in his life, he still maintained his style, his sense of humor, his um, talents for rapping, and is utilizing it to inspire others and to uplift souls. And this is the idea that Hasidus teaches of transforming or channeling the gifts that Hashem gave us and utilizing it for a godly purpose. I want to give you a bracha, a blessing, Rabbi Mati, that together with your wife and your six beautiful children, you should continue mechayel al chayel from strength to strength, continued okay. success in inspiring and uplifting souls. And um, we're going to open it up to uh, questions. I know that one lesson that is I've taken from this, and we've talked about it here, but you brought it out in such a beautiful way. It's never too little, and it's never too late. And hopefully we're all inspired to make improvements in our own lives. And as Rabbi Mati says, I expect the questions to come in, and the hachlota, the good resolutions. Um, I'm here, I'm available for those that would like to take on a mitzvah. Let's do it. Let's do it. Well, Mark and Helene have started first. I got a message from Mark saying, what's the Hebrew word for that washing cup? Because we're buying one tonight. So Mark and Helene, good for you. Already making beautiful additions and steps in your home, but you want the blessing in the washing cup. That's amazing. Yes. Just wow, <laughs> mazel tovs. Cool. That didn't take very long. So I think the way we're going to do this is, if somebody has a question, you could unmute yourself. The only thing I ask is that there's one person or one frame unmuted at a time so that the audio, we can hear everything clearly. I'm going to actually mute myself and Rabbi Mati will answer the questions, but if we could do this one at a time, that would be awesome. Rabbi. Go ahead. Bruce, yes. Go. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I can't see you. Could you put your um, camera on? I can't put the camera on. Uh, okay, go ahead, Bruce. Okay. I, Whoa, I want... Sylvia. I'm sorry. Did anybody just... Sylvia, you shared that with everybody. So is it okay to share it publicly? I, I guess it's public because you, uh, you, you chatted with everybody. Yeah. Um, we are turning our kitchen, kitchen kosher this weekend. Sylvia! Wow. Unbelievable. Wow. Hey, Mati, is this the reaction you get every time you speak? I wish. <laughs> Our community is special. Our community must be very special, but you definitely left uh, an impact here tonight. Anyway, Bruce, go ahead. You're on. Uh, Rabbi, I, you know, I can relate to your story. I'm a, I'm a Brooklyn boy, born and raised. I moved out to Southern California. I know a lot of the people that are watching tonight, so I want to say a big hello to my friends in, in Southern California. I relocated back to uh, New York. Oh. And Rabbi, I could uh, relate to your story because in certain respects, I have a similar one. And I was introduced uh, by a very good friend of mine to Chabad about 12 years ago. And uh, shortly thereafter, through my friend, Gene Goldsman, uh, brought me into uh, Chabad. And finally, uh, with the uh, Rabbi and Rebetzin and Laguna Miguel. So my question to you, Rabbi, is that I know you mentioned it, but I want you to refresh my memory because I'm very inspired with your story. It's late here uh, on the East Coast. It's almost 12 o'clock. But your rabbi, rabbi, your story was so inspiring to me that although I was tired and I'm an early riser, because as Gene says, the early bird catches the worm. Uh, what, at what point, Rabbi, uh, and you might have mentioned this, and I, I might have stepped away. 
were you inspired and to get off from drugs to really get into Judaism, so to speak, that led you to become a rabbi? What was what? Good, good question. Good question. So, uh, with, without sharing the the whole story, in, basically, what took place was that uh, as I was learning about Judaism and I learned about the depth of of having a connection, one mitzvah at a time, I realized that the high that I was trying to have through drugs um, was a short-lived high that had a crash, and the more and more that I grew as a Jew, the more I was getting on a high that was long lasting and never crashes. It just keeps going up and up and up. That's the, that's the short answer to, uh, to the long, the long journey. Well, Rabbi, okay. I just, I just like to, um, request, I think there's, I get a feeling there's going to be quite a few questions here. We all have uh, interest in what the rabbi has to say. If we could keep, the questions brief so everybody could have a chance to ask one. If you'd like to ask a question, if you could just raise your hand and I will unmute you. Who is he? Who? I'm sorry. Raising your hand. Oh, okay, go ahead. Can we have another song? <laughs> if you're going to twist my arm, I mean, <laughs> sure, no problem. It would be my honor and pleasure. Um, the question is, which one? Hmm. Ah, that's a tough one. Okay. So let's go with a song. It's called The Inner Battle. Because we all have within us this inner battle, this inner tension, a friction. Part of us wants to, you know, go in one direction. Another part wants to go in another direction. And the reason that we have this tension is because we have two different forces inside of us. We have two different souls. We have a soul which is actually a godly soul, which wants mitzvahs and wants to do the right thing, etc. It's selfless. And then we have a part of us which is sometimes called the animal soul or the natural soul, etc. It's not a bad guy, but it just tries to get us to do things that are for the here and now, what feels good right here, right now. And um, that's called the animal soul. So this song is a dialogue between the two souls, between the animal soul and the godly soul. And on the CD, the voices are actually different. Um, they're both me, but one of them is electronically modified. So the animal voice soul sounds like very deep. But when I'm doing it live, it's hard to change my voice. So instead, what, what, what I did was that on the slides, they're in different colors. It's color coded. So whenever it's in blue, that's the godly soul speaking. And whenever it's in red, that's the animal soul speaking. And when it's in black, that's just the narrator. So um, without further ado, we'll go ahead and do the inner battle. All right. And I already know that you guys are all going to be into it. So we're going to end with a bang. Sounds good, Alan? Battle going on inside us oh, yeah. Between the godly soul <laughs> and the animal soul. The question is, who's going to win the battle? Who's going to win the war? There's, There's a, a battle right inside us between the two forces. The battle is mine and the battle is yours. And make the right choices between the two voices. Fight it, fight it, and let's choose what's right. There's a battle right inside us between the two forces. The battle is mine and the battle is yours. And make the right choices between the two voices. Fight it, fight it, and let's choose what's right. We all have two souls that are fighting right inside us, known as the Nefesh Elikis and Nefesh Abahamis in English. English, it's the godly soul and the evil conscience. I'm the godly soul. La chela kela kami mal mamish. I'm the party you trying to tell you to always be honest, always trying to connect to godliness, constantly striving. I'm constantly fighting the evil conscience, trying to stop him from controlling our actions. He's trying to cause so many problems. Ha, huh, my name is the animal soul. Nice meeting you. I've seen you many times and you all have seen me too. I'm scheming to be leading you to evil and I'm dreaming to keep feeding the ego in all people. Between me and you, be in the godly soul. I'm seeking pleasure. 
that's immediate Scheming with my buddies who are seriously geniuses Read into your feelings, lead you places that are meaningless Never leaving you alone, know exactly where your weakness is There's a battle right inside us between the two forces The battle is mine, and the battle is yours And make the right choices between the two voices Fight it, fight it, and let's choose what's right There's a battle right inside us between the two forces The battle is mine, and the battle is yours And make the right choices between the two voices yeah, you already quit smoking the animal soul gets in your head He tells you that you're getting stressed have a bit of a cigarette The godly soul then says to him and that's ridiculous You're addicted and one cigarette can make you get sick again That's illegitimate look it up on the internet One cigarette won't get you sick because it's just a little bit This is a typical predicament you're getting and you start to rationalize Although it's to your detriment quit bickering I'm trying to make you feel better be clever in the long run don't you want to breathe better see that i'm trying to make you feel good right now please man put the cigarette and the light down don't put it down light it don't listen you gotta fight it just ignite it man you'll like it don't gotta be short-sighted inner friction we all live with gotta fight it every minute gotta listen to the godly soul make the proper decision there's a battle right inside us between the two forces the battle is mine and the battle is yours and make the right choices between the two voices fight it fight it and let's choose what's right there's a battle right inside Inside is between the two forces the battle is mine and the battle is yours and make the right choices between the two voices fight it fight it and let's choose yeah the constant back and forth the battle that you can't ignore the animal soul versus the godly soul is what we have in store attack each other back and forth like bulls attack the matador the battles for thought and speech and action of the man at war use our might so we could choose what's right because every step of our life you're living through a fight and it's true the fight can last all through your life the main thing is not to give up gotta do what's right gotta use our might so we could choose what's right because every step of our life you're living through a fight and it's true the fight can last all through your life the main thing is not to give up gotta do what's right there's a battle right inside us between the two forces the battle is mine and the battle is yours and make the right choices between the two voices fight it fight it and let's choose what's right there's a battle right inside us between the two forces the battle is mine and the the battle is yours and make the right choices between the two voices fight it fight it and let's choose what's right there's a battle right inside us between the two forces the battle is mine and the battle is yours and make the right choices between the two voices fight it fight it and let's choose what's right there's a battle right inside us between the two voices the battle is mine and the battle is yours and make the right choices between the two voices fight it fight it and let's choose what's right gotta fight Fight it, fight it, and let's choose what's right. Fight it, fight it, and let's choose what's right. Yeah, and let's choose what's right. Lechayim, everybody, lechayim. <laughs>、oh. Alan,、okay. I don't see rapping anywhere. Wait, Rabbi, you are muted. Let's let's redo、am、the answer there. Am I unmuted now? Yeah, no. There you go. <laughs> okay, very good. One of the nice things about mute、uh, about Zoom, you can mute a rabbi. Some people dream of that opportunity in shul. Could you imagine? Wow! If somebody invented a machine that could do that, here you have it on Zoom. Anyway, we would so, never,、um, we would never mute our rabbi. I not yours. No. Right, right. That's an exception. I, and, you know, there are those rabbis. Anyway, so、um, I'll just share my screen again so you could see the album cover, so you know what to look up on Spotify. Um, so this is the name of the my stage name is actually More to Life. It's a play on words of my Hebrew name, which is Mordechai. More to Life, Mordechai. Get it? Okay. And then the album name is Coming Home. So if you look it up, it's also on on the other music outlets like iTunes and all of the other ones. But those are paid ones, so don't waste your money. You can get it for free on Spotify. <laughs> And what's the what's the name of your synagogue that you're associated with? It's it's Chabad of Delaware. 
It's the only the only Chabad house in Delaware. There's one on campus and there's one in the community. So I'm in the community. Hmm. I'd like to uh, welcome and invite my friend, my dear friend, Dr. Neil Neymark. L'chaim, Neil. So we can uh, get to unmute Neil. L'chaim, L'chaim. What a beautiful Chaim. story. Thank you for sharing. Pleasure. Thank you for listening. Oh, yes, great. our pleasure. <laughs> for, for a rabbi to speak is never an issue. It's getting people to listen. That sometimes <laughs> is the challenge. <laughs> We can, we just talk to ourselves all day. If you're ever wondering what we do at home, just talk. <laughs> I, I know that Neil enjoyed your songs, right? Correct. <laughs> all of Thank them. You. Thank you. All right, Mark and Helene, you're you're on. You want to unmute yourself, or I'm going to try to unmute you. Still muted. You still muted. She said it's not working. It's not working. Oh, how do you say Oive? Oh, Oive is like this. Hey, hey. This is Baruch Hashem. This is Oive. But well, we're much Oive. more into the Baruch Hashem than the oh, Oive. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm on. Yes. All right. Well, you brought me to tears. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, you have a wonderful story um, Rabbi and Creeny thank you for this and to our new friend Rabbi more to life thank you um, you can relate to all the young people in this world you should keep going and go far thank you thank you so I really it means a lot thank you Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else raise your hand? If you have a question. Neil? Oh. I know, I'm trying to, hold on one second. I have two hands being raised, Neil and Alan. Go ahead and unmute yourself. And I, try and... I just had to say goodbye to everyone. I have to run. <laughs> oh. oh, okay. No question. Thank you, Rabbi Craney. Thank you, it was Neil, beautiful. Good to see you. Thank oh, you, Rabbi. You. Pleasure. Nice. Take care. Nice, nice to you. meet you. Likewise. <laughs> Thank you so much. Alan, go ahead. Thank you, Neil. Sure. Rabbi Moti. Could you yes. clarify um, when your transformation began from being a rapper to a rabbi? Were you in college already, or is uh, I'm trying? I I can't recall exactly. Did you get the hug first? Go to the Shabbos first, or meet your friend um, Jason and went to visit to him in uh, Jerusalem in the yeshiva? So. Good question. So the chronicle, chronological order was um, the Shabbos meal. Yeah. Um, I was in about eighth grade. The hug was about 11th grade. Ah. Um, the college was obviously, I was 18, 19 years old. And then when I was in my second year of college, so 19, that's when I went to speak to Jason. Mm -hmm. And then when I, I was 20, when I went to yeshiva. So about seven years from your first start of some Jewish connection, if, if that's correct or not. A, so a little, uh, yeah, 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 more or less. At eighth grade, you're about 13, I'm thinking, maybe 12 or 14. Right, right, right. It was about a seven-year journey to find yourself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, those, yeah, yeah. Those were just highlight moments. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Took a while. 
and and I'm blessed that it only took seven years. A lot of people, it, it takes a, a lifetime. So Baruch Hashem for that. If I remember correctly, Rabbi Mati, it was Rabbi Ari Weinstein. You got it. That gave you that big hug. So here's where the world gets a little smaller because the rabbi that gave Rabbi Mati the hug is a dear friend and classmate of mine. In fact, we were study partners over the phone uh, several years ago. And um, what a beautiful story to happen to such a beautiful rabbi. So uh, there's a personal connection here. Yeah, this is a picture of him in the virtual background. And um, yeah, he's still my mentor to this day. Speak yes. to him, uh, speak to him often, and he's just an unbelievable teacher, person, friend, and author. Also, he released a book called "It's Within You," which I highly recommend to everybody. I read it myself, and it's really it helped me in a lot of ways. It's like a self-help book, but from a Jewish perspective. And he co-wrote it together with a psychologist. Um, it's fantastic. It's called "It's Within You," and it can be found on Amazon. And I don't make commission on it. So, <laughs> well, wonderful. Please send him our best. Anybody ha else have uh, the last question? Okay, Rabbi Mati. Once again, thank you very, very much for this inspiring and uplifting evening. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, or at least whoever is still on the call, I'm waiting for your phone calls questions or suggestions for a mitzvah that you would like to add because the way Rabbi Mati so eloquently and so succinctly put it, it's another opportunity to connect. The word commandment not only does not give the word mitzvah justice, sometimes it sends the wrong message. These are cables that connect us to our loving God and 613 opportunities like Rabbi Mati said Come on, why stop there? I love it. <laughs> anyway, Rabbi Mati, thank you. Thank you. Continue. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you all. Yes, continue uplifting people. All the best. Baruch Hashem. <laughs> Take care. Thank you all so much for joining us.